Welcome everyone. My name is Christopher Van Houten, and I am proud to be your NIAS president. And I'm especially proud of the moment uh, that we're about to experience right now. It's actually the thing that I've been looking forward to most this whole conference. Um, just a little bit of background with this. So the title of this is Critical Conversations in School Psychology, a presidential discussion leading with intention. The concept for the Critical Conversations series was brought on by Gregory Mellon and Carlita Joseph here to my right a few years ago. And this past winter, in December and January, we were fi finally able um, to realize it into fruition. And we did uh, four virtual talks. Um, Dr. Celeste Malone was one of them, Dr. Uh, Stacey Williams, Dr. Byron McClure, and Dr. Jack Maglieri. Um, we got traction across the country. Uh, everybody was talking about it. And when we were kind of wrapping up that last talk with Dr. Williams, we were talking about you know the significance um, of uh, leadership in school psychology across the country. And it became very apparent to us that we needed to do something in person, especially on Long Island. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the space that NIASP has created um, in regards to social justice. Um, this past year, we have created an EDI scholarship as a way to support the work of diverse school psychologists. Uh, NIAS recognizes the importance of a diverse workforce, the importance of a uh, to support a diverse group of students who look like them, identify with them, and or share lived experiences with them. We've made a commitment to the NASP Exposure Project, which exposes high school students and undergrads, especially those with diverse backgrounds, to school psychology as a career. In the words of uh, Dr. Charles Barrett, one day at a time, one presentation at a time, we can all do our part to help diversify the field of school psychology. And finally, this critical conversations in the school psychology series. Um, we wouldn't be where we are today without Gregory and Carlina. Uh, this is their baby, and I cannot even state emphatically enough how proud I am of both of you. Uh, for thank you. For all your hard work in this space, um, for being my cultural broker, Dr. Malone, I've learned so much from you. Uh, you've been patient with me as I've reflected uh, on my own social justice journey, uh, especially as a white cisgendered male. I've done a lot of reflection, especially over these last couple of years, um, and it's been really important, um, and you both have been really important in my journey. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Gregory and Carlina. Well, you can do better than that for our president of NIAS, Chris. Thank you so much. And one more time for yourselves, we're grateful that you are here. Give a round of applause just for yourselves. And thank you for the week. We're here. And we're really excited about this tremendous conversation. Uh, we are here to have a conversation like no other. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure that anything like this has happened. It has not happened at all. This is the first time. Before I continue, I want to give my props uh, to my president-elect, Carlita Joseph. Who, uh, um, for the first time ever, uh, the APA president, the NASP president, and the TSP, TSP president are black professionals, and they are tremendous, tremendous individuals. That you, not only that you should know, but we are adamant that communities should know uh, who these people are. They, they continue to do tremendous work, and one of the reasons why this conversation is important is because communities need to know uh, that they have representatives, um, and there are people that are representing their interests. And one of the reasons also this conversation needs to happen, because this conversation takes a tremendous amount of courage. Uh, courage to look at the facts, courage to look at the information, and courage, courage to lead uh, in a different direction. And we're very, very excited about these leaders that are here today. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Gregory. Um, I do want to thank each and every one of you for uh, showing up here today, because like Greg said, this is a very important conversation. 
Um, I want to thank our speakers for even agreeing to do this conversation and taking time out because we know that you all are very busy. <laughs> but we do thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to can I introduce him? Absolutely. There we go. So I just wanted to do short bios for everyone. I know we don't have a lot of time because we have a very packed conversation, an important conversation. Uh, Dr. Celeste Malone is an associate professor and coordinator of the school psychology program at Howard University. Uh, she received her master's degree in school counseling from John Hopkins University and her doctorate in school psychology from Temple University. And she completed her postdoctoral fellowship in child and clinical, I'm sorry, child clinical and pediatric psychology at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Celeste's primary research interest relates to multicultural and diversity issues embedded in the training and practice of school psychology. Specifically, her work addresses the development of multicultural competence through education and training, diversification of the profession of school psychology, and the relationship between culturally responsive practice and pre-K through 12 student outcomes. Related to her interest, Related to her interest in professional issues in school psychology, Celeste has continuously held leadership positions in psychology professional associations and has been recognized for her ongoing leadership and commitment to social justice in school in psychology by presidential recognitions from NASP, the Maryland School Psychologist Association, and APA Division 16 School Psychology. Celeste is the 2022-2023 NAS president and notably is the second person of color to ever serve in this role. Thank you, Dr. Celeste Moore. We have Dr. Frank Morrell, is a distinguished professor at the University of California, Berkeley. His areas of expertise include at-risk youth, cultural identities, scale development, talent development, time perspective, and the translation of psychological research findings into practice. Author of over 300 scholarly works, Dr. Worrell is a fellow of the Association of Psychological Science, the American Educational Research Association, and five divisions of the American Psychological Association, an elected member of the Society of the Study of School Psychology and the National Academy of Education. A former editor of Review, of educational research, Dr. Worrell is a recipient of the Distinguished Scholar Award from the National Association of Gifted Children and Distinguished Contributions to Research Award from Division 45 of APA. It's <sighs> <laughs> a lot of stats. It's a lot of stats. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Worrell is also the 2022 president of the American Psychological Association. Thank you, Dr. Warren. We got one more, and I'm so glad that it's shortened because all of her stats are ridiculous. Um, Dr. Stacy Williams is the New York State Education Department MTSS One Director and Adjunct Professor, Associate Professor at Marist College, a licensed psychologist and certified school psychologist in New York State. Dr. Williams is also involved in the training and assessment team in delivering a social justice training model for the college. At the national level, Dr. Williams is president of Trainers of School Psychologists, or TSP. She regularly provides training in social justice, creating inclusive classrooms, academic and behavior interventions, database decision making for teachers, and university and school partnerships. Thank you again for joining us, Dr. Stacey Williams. We're going to ask a number of questions. Some of these, a lot of these questions are going to be um, very much needed questions, but questions that challenge, that, that may challenge us a little bit, a little bit about views. And uh, again, we are grateful to NAS, grateful to TSP, grateful to ABA, and more importantly, we're grateful to NIAS and the board of NIAS, who's, who has been fostering conversations like this for some time now. We're grateful, I'm grateful to be a part uh, of this organization. With that said, uh, the first question, um, what makes, again, what makes this conversation special is that the APA, NASP, and TSP have elected three black presidents all at the same time. However, according to the most recent NASP survey, we know that the field of school psychology is made up of predominantly white, white female practitioners. 
black school psychologists make up a total of 3.9% of the field. If we account for males, that number drastically drops. And when I looked at that, I'm like, that's me. That's you. That's me. Um, knowing these statistics and having gone through your own challenges as black leaders, what does it mean for you to be on the stage leading the most prominent professional organizations in the field? First amazing question, who's gonna go first? We want to hear from all three of you with this question. I'll go, Absolutely. I'll go for it. Um, and first off, thank you to NIAS for creating the space to have these conversations because it's important to tell stories. We often see these names listed on the website, but they're abstractions. You don't know who they are, how they got there, but this whoever signs your membership letter. And so to put some flesh to it, that we are real people with real lives and have real stories behind us. So when it comes to being here and all of us being involved, and we have a long history of being involved, I think about leadership for this specific time. And while this should not be an anomaly, we recognize that it is, but nonetheless, incredibly grateful that we're each positioned within our respective associations at this point of time in US history, at this point of time in the profession, and when I talk about the profession, school psychology and psychology more broadly, um, because psychology and school psychology has contributed to a number of inequities that have been highlighted earlier. So when I think about representation, I think that we want to diversify the profession in that when people see that the president of their national association looks like them, it sends a message of belongingness, that there is a space for me. Um, because most school psychologists, certainly not me, um, because the last president, Deborah Crockett, who was the first black president of NAS, who was well over 20 years ago. And so when we think about me being the second, we also have to consider that gap. And within that gap, what questions and what issues did we not address because there wasn't someone at the table to make it known that this was an issue in the first place? What did we just choose not to do? Um, there is an interest in social justice and diversity, but how I've experienced a lot of times in leadership that it can be an academic effort for a lot of my leadership colleagues in engaging in these conversations. And they approach it as such, that this is a problem to be solved, and try to look at it as objectively as possible. I cannot do so. This is not an academic exercise for me. This is real life. Same as it is for real life of the individuals that we want to bring into the profession, the students that we serve in pre-K through 12 schools, because students of color, so black students, will become black adults, and we want them to view school psychology and psychology as a whole as a viable profession. But when they do not see individuals who look at like them, particularly in our highest levels of leadership, it sends a powerful message about who belongs in our associations and who does not. And so I'm hoping that I have met the next black president of NAST at some point already, um, and that it will not be another 20 years that there are individuals, particularly graduate students, because I came up as a graduate student leader, who see me and know that this is going to be a viable option for them to make the changes they know need to happen in the profession. Dr. Williams. Well, we can go before Frank. Um, that was a really good, great um, response. So I, I tend to say that I'm an accidental leader and my friends get really mad at me. But I, I love the fact that um, Celeste said that I've been doing this work for a very long time without a title. So in Trainers of School Psychology, um, I shared with someone recently that I'm always open to the universe and open to opportunities. And one of my core values is equity. And no matter what it is that I'm doing, um, equity is going to infuse the work that I'm doing. And so I remembered when NASP was in Washington, D.C., and Cynthia Hazel, who's a professor at University of Denver, um, I tend to interact with a lot of my colleagues more informally than probably formally. And Cynthia and I have a tradition. And whenever we're at a conference, we engage in a self-care activity. I'm all about getting outside and immersing oneself in nature because I think work-life balance is really important. And while in DC doing the bowls or doing some jumping shots, if you really know me, Cynthia said, Stacy, you should get involved in TSP. 
And I was like, what? I, I don't want to get involved in TSB. She's like, you should. And she said, I have the perfect role, and I've already spoken to Mark Turgeson, and you're going to take over membership coordinator. And I'm like, but I haven't said yes. And she's like, yeah, but this is what you're going to do. And so I go to an event, and I run into Mark, and Mark said, Mark, who's at St. John's, said, oh, Stace, I hear you're going to be taking over membership coordinator. And I'm like, but I didn't say yes. But you know what? I took that over. I revamped the system. I, I, I brought us Wild Africa. And I still don't know anything about it, but I, you know, I brought us well Africa, and you know, I was happy in that role, you know, just doing that role. And um, uh, Sarah um, from Nova University, who's white female, and one of the things that I've learned is leveraging the privilege of the white women in the profession. And um, Sarah said to me when she was president. She was like, Stace, I would like you to um, do a diversity workshop at TSP. She's like, you're, you're being underutilized in the position on the board. And I was okay with being underutilized <laughs> um, because we know that junior black faculty get saddled with um, service requirements. And I was like, are you serious? And so I, I did it and I ran this workshop. And I remember Amanda Nickerson, who's over there, who's one of my mentors, was in the audience. And um, apparently it was to a sold out audience and people wanted more. And um, Sarah was like, you know, we're creating a social justice committee and I think you should chair it. This is what happens when you do one thing well and they keep giving you more stuff. And so I chaired the social justice committee. And in that role, you know, I stepped into that role when um, President Trump actually was transitioning into office. And I spent four years writing position statements. Like, when I tell you, every week, my team and I, our social justice committee, we were writing position statements reminding trainers of school psychology why we were in this profession, reminding them that we had to maintain inclusivity and civility in the spaces because we were, we were tasked with training um, practitioners and future trainers who are going to be culturally responsive individuals. And when I tell you for those four years, we got tired to the point where we're like, you know, we're sick and tired of being reactive and we needed to be proactive. And so one of the things I did without a title, you know, now I have the title, I ain't doing nothing, but anyway, <laughs> one of the things that I did without a title was that we, 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 did two um, special um, um, issue uh, um, journal for our flagship journal where we focused on um, culturally responsive pedagogy. And um, we got so many responses from the field and we, re we really talked about what, is it to, what does it mean to be a trainer who practice from um, a social justice lens? What, it mean, what does it mean to center your work in critical race theory? Now I'm in this position, and when I said I, it's accidental, because I'm okay being in the background. Like, I'm okay sitting on the floor. One of many of y'all probably passed me on the floor and was like, who's that person? I'm okay doing that. But now I'm in this space and I realize the importance of continuing to have discussion with our board about really centering the work that we're doing around equity. And when I talk about equity, I'm talking about equity for all of us. I'm not only talking about one type of equity. Another thing that I'm really passionate about, especially in our board, it's really um, talking about ways in which we support our uh, minoritized faculty thriving in the academy because we know that there are research that suggests that the academy was not designed for us. Y'all heard how much publication this man over here had. I tell him he crazy. Like I said, and sometimes when I run into Frank, I'm like, do you sleep? You know, and so the idea is, you know, as one of the, um, for my presidency this year, I'm really focused on two things pedagogy, culturally responsive pedagogy in the classroom, and also making sure that our scholars of color, who many of are actually leaving the field, are actually thriving in these spaces that were not designed for us. And you've been pulling people into love. You've been bowing total people ever since, by the way. Always <laughs> Dr. Warren. Yeah, um, so I'd like to echo, um, I think, something that Celeste said, because I think we often focus on the lack of the 3.9% of, of blacks um, 
and school psychology, there are small numbers of Latinos and, and so forth. If we don't get more people into grad school, if we don't get more people into undergraduates, if we don't get more people graduating from uh, high school, you know, so, so that we really, uh, a lot of the problem starts um, really low down. And um, one of the things that APA does, we have a, 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 a committee called Trainers of Psychology in Secondary Schools. Now I'm going to be speaking to that group actually in December. Um, and we've been involved, I've done a lot of uh, talks to, to high school classes because I think it's really important. Um, certainly I'm one of the people who I think would have said a long time ago, I don't want to be a role model, I don't see myself as a role model. And I recognize now, you know, and, and certainly in the past few years, that that's, it's not an option. You can't help right? Whether you want to be or not, you are, people are going to be looking at you. And, and it's really important that we be in these spaces so that, in fact, this sense of belonging um, opens the door for others. Many of the individuals who go into psychology, who are um, minoritized individuals, go, um, they study, um, they go into counseling psychology because counseling psychology spends a lot of time studying issues related yeah. to the people of yeah. color. And I think you don't see the same thing in the school, in school psychology. So, so there are a number of things that we have to do. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, I actually am the second black male president of APA. The first one was 1971. Um, Kenneth Clark, the talk studies. But um, in the last few years, AB has actually sort of stepped up its game. The 2017 president um, was Latino, um, the 2018 and 2019 presidents were African American females, the 2021 president was an African American female, uh, the 2023 president is going to be an African American female. So AB also has a presidential, a black presidential trio this year. And we are hoping, in fact, my last presidential column for the magazine, we're having a picture of the presidential trio because we want this to go, this goes to all 130 something thousand members. Because this is important um, to see. And I, the last thing I'd say is that I gave a talk at North Carolina State. I think um, Jeff Braden um, had invited me to the Department of Psychology. They put it out on the trainers of school psychologists listserv. Um, and at the end of that talk, a young man came up to me. Uh, and I saw him sitting, he was sitting in the front row. And he came up and he said hello and, and asked some questions about being a psychologist. And I said, Sure, and, I, and then he said, um, I said, so you're an undergrad? He says, no, I'm a sophomore in high school, <laughs> right? And I was like, whoa. And his mom said, yeah, yeah, I had to bring him here. <laughs> his mom, I'm his mom, right? <laughs> and stuff. And it turns out that he has decided he wants to be a psychologist. Now he's Latino, not, not African American. But he's decided he wants to be a psychologist and has was been paying attention to the North Carolina website, the Department of Psychology's website, and saw that the talk was happening and begged his mom to bring him wow. to this wow. talk. Tremendous. And then it turns out that he's gay. And I said I was gay during the talk. And, and for him, this was just opened the world to him because, in fact, you know, and I have to say, the APA convention this year, the number of people came up to me international students, black people, um, you know, other people of color. Trinidadians themselves, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago originally, um, but in fact, representation matters. Yes. And, and, and that, by the way, pay attention, it's going to be, it's one of the presidential themes of Dr. Bryant, who is next year's APA president, she is doing a, an issue on that and, and, and stuff, so. Wow, wow, that is, that is phenomenal stuff happening. But I want to go back to, you said that in 1978 was the first black man? 71. 71, and then now you're the second. And for you, it was a 20 year gap as well. Um, and it's just, it's it's amazing that we're having these things, a 20 years in between, and all we're having first like this in 2022. It, it, you know, it's, it's mind blowing to me. But it matters. But it, it does matter, right? Um, but I want to take a step back. So in light of some of the events that happened in 20, 2020, right? Killing of George, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, um, it just it threw the, the country into this, just a, a racial awakening or a cultural awakening. It just, it, it up, 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 upended everything, honestly, right? Um, but then people were taking it seriously. And they were talking about it more, and it was more. It was a more we were taken seriously. It wasn't going to go away this time. Um, and then Dr. Rowe, the APA, presented an apology, right, for its participation in the role of promoting, perpetuating, and failing to challenge racism and racial discrimination and human hierarchy in the U.S. 
but it wasn't well accepted by everyone, specifically organizations like ABCI. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, the first thing I said, and I, I said this when I was on the board, um, when you do an apology, you're not doing it to get forgiveness. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And that's, and so whether ABCI chooses to um, accept it or not is not the relevant piece of information to me. The question is what, do, what does the APA do with that apology moving forward? Um, to address, um, and to tie this to the comment you made earlier, we talk about, you know, one of my columns, presidential columns this year, um, was a nation of firsts. Um, I, I, I did it when Ketanji Brown Jackson got confirmed um, to the Supreme Court. Um, we often, I think, I, I was a history teacher before, an <laughs> English teacher before I became a psychologist. And I tend to think in historical time. If we think about it, Brown versus Board of Education is 1954. That's not that long ago. The Civil Rights Act was the 60s. So, yes. you, you know, the, you know, um, the, the Voting Rights Act. So there's a lot of stuff. I mean, there's a very recent past, right? So we had the first black president, <laughs> you know, 2008. So that in fact, even though I think it seems like a long time, we know it, we're tribal. We're tribal and we support our own and, and that's what I think has been happening. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so um, I think it's great in some sense that George Floyd's death, not that he died, but that in fact it galvanized the world because it wasn't just the US. And I think in large part, the US got galvanized, the world got galvanized because we were in lockdown. Mm -hmm. And people could not escape the news. There are people who would have been at work and not paying attention. Right, right. But they weren't at work. They were at home and they were worried. There was existential threat mm -hmm. and stuff and that gave them a focus. And it gave it a focus. Now it has been trying to do stuff in this space for quite a while. 1968, there's um, 75 black psychologists left APA to form the Association of Black Psychologists, ABCI. And, and you know, we've had sort of a rocky <laughs> relationship with that group ever since. But, you know, we have tried, in fact, in 1978, I believe, um, the leaders of um, many of the associates, ABCI met with the leaders of APA. There was a conversation in 2015, 2005, APA brought in representatives of each of the ethnic psychological associations as observers to council. We were trying to get right. a vote so they could get a voting seat on council. And that failed three times. That ballot failed, the council passed it. Um, now they have a voting seat because that also happened in 2020. Right, right. That was another opportunity to get, send that ballot by those measure out again and we got it passed. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a lifetime member of ABCI, so let me say this. And I, I will say that ABCI is not monolithic, right? There are many people who are fine with the apology, and there are many of us who are members of both associations. Uh, Kevin Copley, whose some, name some of you may know, he was the editor of the Journal of Black Psychology. He's currently the president of Division 45 of the APA. So, so I think ABCI has defined itself in opposition to APA in many ways, and I think they are going to have to work through that. I actually decided when the apology, the decision was made to do the apology, we passed that apology last year, I decided I was not going to do a presidential meeting <laughs> because it's, the apology was the beginning of a process. Okay. And so I then said, my job is to see that this becomes institutionalized within ABA, and that's what I've tried to do. So at our meet, um, the council meeting in August, we actually passed an, an equity, an, um, a racial action equity plan. Right. So that's going forward, and so they have to report to council every year. And the board also passed earlier this year seed money. What we are seeding 1.1 million dollars to start doing work in this area. We are also meeting every year annually with the leaders of the ethnic psychological associations. Again, that was my idea. We started doing that last year. This is the second year we will be doing that. We have one more group to meet with um, at this point um, for this year, the Asian American Psychological Association. And you know, and I am here t today, but I will point out, right at the same time that this conference is happening, the National Latinx Psychological Association is having its meeting. And I would have been there, but I promised to be here, and this was important <laughs> for me to be in this space. Yes. But the president-elect is there, the past president is there, the <coughs> CEO of AP are there, because we are really trying to say, um, as one of my ABCI colleagues who tends to be somebody who doesn't trust APA, she says, is this a moment or a movement, <laughs> right? That, 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 that's it's a thing, right? And what we are trying to do is say that this is a movement, a movement. not just yes. a movement. And by putting these things in place, and we are lucky in the sense that we've had 
three black presidents in a row. We, um, we'll find out at the end of um, uh, this month who the next president is, but the, I don't think there's anybody black on the ballot this year. So um, <laughs> we know it won't be a black person. We'll be a Latin expert, a Latin woman. Right. 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 But yeah, so. Yeah. Um, and so I, I appreciate that response because I think school psychologists, we need to engage with the apology. And part of it is school psychology is in this weird place that we are a profession in our own right. We have our own defined standards. We have an ethics code. We can define who is a school psychologist and who is not a school psychologist in our standards of practice. But we're also a subdiscipline of psychology itself. And so oftentimes when we think about the Rocky history, because I, I I'm a history buff as well, and a school psychology nerd, which makes this job perfect for me. Um, <laughs> but when we look at some of the tensions between school psychology and psychology, they're understandable, but we can't divorce ourselves from that part of our history. Right. Psychology is part of our title. We are school psychologists. We're not just schools. Or, like we, Psychology is a core part of what we do. And when we know about the early development of school psychology, it really is in lockstep with the growth of psychology as a discipline in the United States. And so when we look at APA's apology, as well as the chronology that they commissioned in looking at the history of APA's and psychologists' role in perpetuating racism in the US, you'll see a lot of familiar names there. Because when we think about even APA's early leaders, a number of them probably could be defined uh, as school psychologists um, because they were child-focused psychologists and doing some clinical work and the title of school psychology wasn't, formal, wasn't formally there yet. So this is very much relevant to us and informative and for us to take a look back at our history that the two people who are credited with the founding of school psychology are most influential, Lightyear Whitmer and um, G. Stanley Hall, if you look at the history books, they were eugenicists, they were racists. The students that they then went on to train, and G. Stanley Hall was the first founding president of APA, and it's known that he was a eugenicist. And when we look at those who have trained, Terman, um, I'm blanking on some names right now, the guy who was the first one to use the title of school psychologist, of course I'm blanking on his name in Chicago, but developing the Stanford Burnett engaging in school-based practice and using these tests to exclude marginal, minoritized youth, primarily youth of color. And so there's much that school psychology has to learn about the apology. I think there's also a lot to learn about ABC's response. Mm -hmm. And as Frank noted, that the purpose of an apology, and again, I encourage you to read it because it, it is a really well-crafted and thorough yes. document as well as the other res the accompanying resolution that talks about what APA will be doing in education or childhood, practice, public interest, criminal justice, it's comprehensive. But still respecting and acknowledging that those who the apology is intended for may not receive it and can identify ways that it falls short. How do you respond to that? You make your work, you let your work speak for itself and think about how APA is doing going forward as opposed to being defensive. And thinking about my own experiences in school psychology and NAS, I can't, I don't know if we would have responded the same way. That within school psychology, there is, and psychology as a whole, <laughs> but particularly school psychology, this air defensiveness, because we haven't been as thoroughly immersed in, in the history of psychology more broadly, and don't see ourselves as part of that history, even though we intimately are. When we think about the track record of the profession itself, when we have, of school psychology, when we've been called out on things like disproportionality, like the excessive, excessive exclusionary discipline, the use of IQ tests, our response until fairly recently has been rather dismissive. I could certainly think of when I started my school psychology program in 2008 and being interested in cultural issues and reading and a lot of assessment, well, most of the multicultural research in school psychology was focused on assessment, identifying individual differences between groups without any discussion about core, um, oppression, racism, and differential access to opportunities. And our research has only served to essentialize race and to focus on, oh, well, these are inherent deficits, and it's not. And so because we haven't reckoned and not familiar with our own history, when we get called out on stuff, 
I have seen a huge amount of defensiveness from individuals from the professional and students talk about the microaggressions that they have in graduate programs or in school psychology spaces, there's this defensiveness. And so what we can learn about it is how to respond when we are very well intentioned, but people don't necessarily receive it. Right. That it's not, oh, well, you're wrong, and you, this is what we meant, but your actions need to speak for it. And so read the documents if you have it, again. But then also think about the actions that APA has taken. How does this apply to school psychology? Because it absolutely does. And we can't just ignore it because it's APA and not NAS. School psychologists are part of psychology. And we need to own the ugly parts of that history. But as well as the promise of moving things forward. The documents are all on the website, yes. the APA website. <laughs> yeah. So they're available for free. You can download them. And they are free. And I, I want to reiterate that it's really important to review them. And I, I, something that you said that um, resonated with me, um, Celeste, is understanding ABCI's response and not dismissing their response. Mm -hmm. Because in reviewing that response, what I see is folks responding to trauma. What I see is PTSD. What I see is folks who've been burned by the system yeah. and literally calling out the system. And, 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 and calling out what the organization that they're fighting against, whether or not what they're doing in that moment is um, performatory, right? And so I, I like the fact when um, Frank said, no, it's not, a mo it's not a moment, it's a movement, right? And you are working on institutionalizing um, these things and holding the organization accountable for the fact that this is what we say that we're gonna do. And this is important on many levels when we talk about diversity issues. Are diversity issues, are they optical? Meaning that we're doing them in the moment. And that's, a, a, let's just be real. That's one of the reasons why minoritized folks don't trust um, organizations that have not historically been responsive to their needs. And it's really difficult to institutionalize policies that check people on their biases, right? And so you have to be intentional about creating these spaces and actually talking about these things daily. And so I'm happy to hear that APA is doing the stuff because you best believe ABCI is going to be watching them. <laughs> and, you know, and it's interesting that you know when when when. Frank talk about Kevin. Kevin is in both worlds, and you know Kevin was very instrumental in ABCI as a junior faculty. I met him as at ABCI, and it's a very you know if you're if you're into African centric um, theories and ideologies, it's a great space to to learn. And when you're reading that statement, that's that's for me what actually stands out in that statement. And then just one more quick comment related to it. Um, I think it highlights the importance of working in and out. Because, and I don't know if you've all felt the same thing, but I know that I've been questioned about my commitment to social justice because I'm perceived as an insider, right? But at the same time, both forces are needed. You need change agents within our organizations. Yes, right. yes. We also need that external pressure to propel us forward. There's absolutely a place in both. And being able to navigate that these are both very much valid forms of leadership and not recognizing those who are pushing from the outside as a threat, nor assuming that those who are working internally are sellouts or not really about the work or were put there as figureheads because I've heard those type of comments before as well. Knowing both of these individuals as well as myself and having been in meetings with them, what you see is what you get when you keep it real. But it's, again, the importance of both. And so even if you're not in formal leadership roles, and as Stacy mentioned that she was a great cheerleader and loved working in the background, those things are needed too, because leadership is not about a title. It's about pushing for change. Yeah. And you could do that in the organization itself. But if you're outside, don't be outside the club hate and do something about it <laughs> instead. And try to push some change and make things different as opposed to observing, complaining, or whatever have you, that you have an absolutely essential role in moving things forward, even when you're operating external to associations because those forces are needed. Yeah. Please. Um, I, I, I don't mean to be controversial, but I, I want to make one point here. Please. That it is important. We will protect you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important. To, I, I come at this um, as a scientist, and I think uh, I, 
And one of the things that happens is that there are different perspectives, right? There are different theoretical perspectives, right? So, so for, there are many people, I study gift and talented. Among, I study at risk youth, I study gift and talented youth. I'm not anti-test. I think assessment is absolutely essential, right? I think you have to be careful how you use it, and you have to understand why the differences exist, right? Um, and, and, and so, I think as psychologists right now, mental health screeners, for instance, are absolutely essential for us to be using in yes. schools, right? And so, so that um, testing in and of itself is not the problem. The problem is not just how we use the test results, but the, uh, you know, our talent development model talks about opportunity to learn. Opportunities have to be provided, yeah. right? On the other hand, we can't, so there's a structural, but we are psychologists, there's also the individual. Opportunities have to be taken up. There's a, there's a, a you know, a, a, a back and forth between the teacher and the student, that class, you know, the curriculum and the student, and so we need to pay attention to all of both, all sides. Yeah. I mean, th this is a great, we're, we're, we're grateful that these conversations are happening with, with all of these organizations, and what you said is, is, is paramount. This is ultimately a larger conversation, just about healing and, and, and ingratiating communities in, into the field. Um, but, you know, much like what you guys have said, you can't help but be healers when someone sees you. Uh, I remember, I, I went to grad school, uh, I, had, I had tremendous profess professors, uh, most of them were white. Um, I had one that was uh, maybe Asian, and, and I had one black professor. And when I came to the board, I saw Stacey, I was like, wow. And immediately took you up as, as a mentor and it created a lot of healing in me to see me at a leadership level. Uh, same thing when I go to movies and I, and I see and I watch, uh, I, I remember watching a movie, I think it was Black Panther, and the whole father scene uh, took me up for a loop and I had tears in my eyes and I immediately called my therapist. <laughs> um, but it was, you don't know you need healing in an area until you are often kind of, uh, how do we continue to have this conversation about healing collectively healing generational trauma, um, and healing so that we can be in these spaces uh, and thrive. I want to start with that. So um, so a passion project for, for me is mentoring. And I've stumbled into mentoring uh, people who look like me. And you know, uh, providing mentoring through the NAS Mentorship um, Network, uh, working with Sherry and, her, and the Minority Scholars through that process. But one of the things that I've learned over the years, it's the importance of community. And in some literature, it's called sisterhood, right? So I'm talking to the sisters. Um, one of the things, again, I have on my trainer's hat, you know, as a trainer, one of the things that they tell you, the importance of building community outside of your institution. If you read the literature on scholars of color thriving, they tell you to identify communities outside of your institutions. And that's one of the um, important things about conferences, because you go to conferences, you run into people that look like you, and you hold on to them. And you're like, you're literally going to mentor me. So that community is important. With community, you don't necessarily have to, to think alike. So when you think about sisterhood in predominantly white spaces, that sisterhood could just be a collection of individuals that you feel comfortable with, that's going to provide you with emotional support, mental support, and all of those ego support. Now, during summer 2020, the world is going crazy, right? And on TSP Listserv, you know, there's a trending on Twitter for, I tell everybody to go to Twitter because that's great professional development, but there's a trending on Twitter about blacks in the ivory. And what was happening was that black folks were coming out and literally talking about the trauma that they were experiencing in these spaces. So if I have students in this audience, you're probably thinking, you see your black professors, you know they're great, you have no idea what they're going on with. What was happening on Twitter was happening in the Trainers of Psychology's listserv, where we were talking about, like, trainers were like, let me tell you, you know, and, and folks were like, oh my god, I can't believe that was your experience. And I'm like, where you all have been at, right? And so what organically happened, different groups popped up, and so this morning, 
In Celeste's presentation, she talked about the black academics. The black academics was one of those spaces that during COVID, that literally started, shout out, shout out to Desiree Vega, who said, we needed to create this space, and people popped in and popped out. It actually created a lot of collaborations between folks. We got into this space, we literally undressed, like, just like, uh, breathe and exhale. And then we went out there we, with, our, with our armor on, and that space was really important. Fast forward, you know, like, you know, one of the things that I'm passionate about, it's not my research, it's my art. And there are a lot of artists in the school psychology community, there are a lot of trainers who are artists. And so during, again, the summer of 2020, a bunch of us got together and we created an artist collective. And we write a few poems. And so whenever we experience, I'm sorry. <laughs> whenever we, we, did a, we did a workshop on this at, at NAS and we led people through some FU poetry. And so whenever, well, I didn't say the whole thing. And so whenever, so think about this. Whenever you experience aggression, you know, Sue has this entire model about the mental, um, 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 I don't even know, the mental, uh, thing that we go, journey that we go through, but trying to question, did that just happen? Is it me? Like, what just happened? Should I say anything? Oh my God, the moment just passed. If I say anything, are they gonna think I'm the angry black woman? If I say anything, are they gonna invalidate my feelings? Literally, you go through this stuff, right? And there are studies that suggest that faculty of color experience a lot of trauma. Now, what's really interesting in Celeste's presentation this morning, she identified some of the things that people feel internally when they're experiencing this stuff. While she was presenting, I texted Carlita and I said, I have to remind myself to breathe. And while she was presenting, there is, there is some stuff that's going on inside when people like me teach the community about the trauma that's experienced by minoritized folks. So this artist collective, we write poetry, we create art, some folks like paint, some folks take picture, and we literally de-stress in this moment so that we can be the leaders that our communities expect us to be. But folks don't understand that. Folks don't understand that in summer of 2020, when they were calling upon us to lead these initiatives, that we were tired. And at one point, you know, like, I love Tara. Tara was like, leave us alone. Like, she went on Twitter, she's like, stop asking black folks to do stuff. And she was like, read, Google. Yeah, it's so, our job to, to, to fix the problem. Yeah. Right, and so the thing is, and so the thing is, there is the, so if we're talking about collective trauma, again, I'm talking about it from a trainer's perspective, the need, or you can also say from a practitioner perspective, the need to create communities in which you can truly be yourself, because that's really important. You know, so let's talk about radical healing and radical hope, the import, and you talked about awareness, the importance of having these spaces where you can literally exhale, having that waiting to exhale moment, so that you can go back out there and be the leader that folks expect you to be. Yeah, I, I echo everything Stacey said about community, and you saw a picture on the earlier slide where it had a picture of our Zoom and getting together. And that was the first Zoom we had after an incident on the trainers forum. Um, we, we, the Zoom was popping that night because we all showed up because in the midst of the murder of George Floyd and things happening within this profession and us feeling it acutely, we really felt the need to be in that space together. So community absolutely matters. But I also think about channeling that energy. And so I highlighted before about strength and resistance and channeling the strong emotions evoked by microaggressions and discrimination into something productive. And I have to say that it's a large part of my work, especially in the midst of 2020, where it was one thing happening another, what's happening on the trainers forum and what's happening in the world, what's happening in NAS, how I'm feeling lots of fields. But I know if I just sat with those feelings and let it eat away at me, it wouldn't be helpful. So what could I do to make other people aware? <laughs> because that's the other thing I think is so important as a leadership perspective to share that this isn't just work, it is labor. And it affects us in a different type of way. Because like I said before, this is not an academic exercise. This is real life. And so I would take these strong emotions and channel it into some type of initiative or idea and fleshing it out or writing a report or tweeting something. Um, a lot of my tweets about school psychology, I guess it could be subtweets of the profession if you want to take it in that way. But 
what is it that I can do to put this, all this energy and all this emotion into something better? But then I also recognize that part of healing is being hopeful and optimistic. Yes. And everything that Stacey highlighted, the increased labor on school psychologists of color in the midst of 2020, you're functioning from that reactive space and from that hurt. But that really isn't sustainable. It's like I pointed out in the diet, sitting in the dialectic of radical healing, that you can't be totally subsumed by oppression and let that be the driver of your change. That I had to get back to a place of feeling more hopeful and engaging and visioning about what I want to see about instead of reacting to all of the things that are happening. And so to me, a lot of my leadership work is healing. Um, to be able to craft the profession that I needed when I was a child, um, the profession that I needed when I started my school psychology program, when I entered into academia, and even now, being the president, still working towards crafting a profession and building a profession in which I truly feel belonging um, and fully a part of. Um, I come at this a little differently, but I think um, my perspectives actually resonate with yours as well. Um, I actually, one thing is I study, I study hope. <laughs> uh, I study hope, I study um, time perspective, so I study, you know, positive and negative attitudes to the past, present, and future. Um, and I think it's interesting because as an immigrant to this country, I actually, um, I think, have a slightly different perspective because I grew up in a context where the leaders of the church and the politicians and everybody looked like me. And so, coming into the United States to do my PhD, you know, it's, it's, it's really a, a revelation. Uh, America has done a number on people of color in, in an interesting way. And in fact, I was actually, um, at, I think my second year of my doctoral program, stopped and was kneeling at the side of the road with a gun held to my head by the police, etc., etc. Was an interesting thing. I and I actually turned. I, I dabble in poetry. I write poetry. I wrote two poems in response to that. One called "I Am Black," and one called "Stay Home," in which I talked about going back to Trinidad because I had. But but that's the the immigrant perspective, right? Because you have an option, right? Yeah. Right? right. And so you cannot. You can sort of divorce yourself from America to some extent and say, "This is not me." Mm. But. The, the heart of what I think is important, and I think it's really important for what we do in schools, and I'm talking about K-12, not university, which is where a lot of people come to terms with the history of this country, is claiming America. And, and, and here's what I mean. Wow. My, I went out, um, I, think in, I think the first semester I was at UC Berkeley, I was out to dinner with several black graduate students. Um, some from the law school and, and, and several others. And one of them asked me casually over dinner, so are you black first or Trinidadian first? And my response was, I'm black and I'm Trinidadian. One is not in front of the other. A common question. And I asked back, so are you black first or American first, expecting to get a similar answer. And what I got back was, I'm black first and American second. And having lived in America, I understand that answer. But I would say, what I say to kids, I say to kids of all the groups, I say to black kids, the strength of America, America's built on slavery, it was built on taking the land from the indigenous peoples, it was built on taking land from, from the, everybody who is here has a claim to this country. And you can't allow, despite the bad treatment, to, to be, allow the country to relegate you to second class status. It's, and that's what it's trying to do. But you got to own, right? You know, you have to say, I say to my colleagues, you know, I have a right, as much a right to be here as you do. And I think that's a, an important message that we need to give the kids time and time again. Wow. We need to take the playbook of those people who tell the lies all the time that people believe and remind everyone, black kids, Latino kids, Native American kids, so, you know, Chinese build the real I mean, the, the contributions of this country the, the, where we are is dependent on what a lot of people, all of our ancestors did. And that needs to be told time and time again. Yeah. I feel the same about school. Oh, sorry. <laughs> say, no, I wanted to add to something that you said, you know, about channeling your, um, your energy into pursuits. 
And one of the things that the trainers of school psychology did was that we were tired of being reactive and we wanted to be proactive. And we, like um, APA, identified and we, we don't have as much money as APA, but um, like APA, we identified little things that we were going to do for our profession and building capacity in our trainers. And so book clubs started up where people met whenever they could meet to build their capacity. And I remember like Jennifer Cooper, who's at Yeshiva, who I absolutely adore, who's an amazing social justice ally. Um, you know, they developed a research project out of that about how, um, um, how to how can white folks support white folks in building cultural um, competency and that was wonderful. Another thing that came out of our anger and you know trying not to have that consume us was we um, Jennifer taking leadership on this really um, created the honoring diverse leaders in school psychology project. And one of the things that we do is we highlight, you know, black school psychologists who are doing amazing work in the field. And, you know, you find like one of the things that I love about Shane Jimerson, he also does this with his journal. And we, we highlight Asian American scholars. We, we um, also do town hall where we work with um, um, individuals who are working with a transgender community in terms of how can we educate our faculty to support students so that they're not um, inadvertently um, engaging in microaggression in the classroom to diverse communities. So we decided that we were no longer going to write position statements because at one point we said, what are the po what is the point? You know, like, so, you know, everybody comes together, there's a writing group, we write, like, what are we going to do? And we literally identify actionable steps that we were going to do and channel our anger into other things. And I remember I had some of my most prolific writing in 2020, and I was quoting Bob Marley and Hale Selassie, and that stuff was getting printed. And I bet you, like, 10 years ago, like, they would have been like, Who's Halo Selassie? You know, like, how can you quote Bar Marley? But I'm like, listen, you know, like, I, I, I may not know how to march, but I know how to write, and I know how to empower, and that was one of the ways in which we channeled our energy. Yeah, and so now you have even more thoughts to name off Stacey's comments. Um, just thinking about the energy and momentum and capitalizing on moments of change. And, and I saw Sherry over there, I, um, I think of one of her articles that's in School Psychology Review, and if you are an ASK member, you were able to access SBR. <laughs> but it's looking at a critical, you know, thinking about a critical school psychology. And some of the metaphors that are used, um, I'm trying to think of it exactly, but like those moments where we have some explosive growth, that it's not a linear process by any means but we're consistently laying the foundation, doing the groundwork, so when the opportunity comes up, we're ready to act. And there have been times, certainly 2020 is one of them, I think of an incident within NAS where there was a microaggression printed in the communique in relation to the Atlanta Convention, and it was retracted, and there was a reprint, all of these things, but how to move forward, I'm like, oh my God, you wanna know how to move forward? I was waiting for this. I had a whole list of, list of things that we could do and, and, and taking that forward to what became, well, the board of directors did implicit bias training and then we also had to continue to do social justice and leadership development training for our board of directors, leadership assembly, and all of our state leadership at our regional leadership meeting. Another important one is what's happening at convention. And so for the first time, well, let me take a step back. The Indigenous American Subcommittee of the Multicultural Affairs Committee, recognizing that we think this association had a place to do this now, but had a conversation about land acknowledgments. And so for the first time for this 2023 convention, if you go to the website, you will see the printed land acknowledgment. Soon to come are the actions and recommendations from the Denver Indian Center about how to support them because we'll be making a financial donation as well as encouraging members to do so and support in however way that center says that they would like our support and seeing this at the convention itself. Um, so taking advantage of these opportunities. But going back to something that Frank said about black kids in, in, in America, 
saying that they are American as well. That's how I feel about school psychologists of color claiming our places within NAS, within APA, within the trainers of school psychologists, within our state associations, because what often happens from my experience and observation that we are brought in and treated as guests. When we are school psychologists in our own right, we have every opportunity and responsibility to be at these tables because I can't think of any state association that isn't begging for leaders and volunteers. We are needed, but too often we're made to feel like guests or that it's a privilege that we're able to do this work when we rightfully deserve these seats at the table because we have been in the profession and despite being pushed out or made to feel excluded or unwanted have continued doing the work to allow us to have this position that we're in right now that it didn't happen overnight it happened because of the work of school psychologists who have been in the field that did not necessarily love or respect them back but they did it for the love of kids and community and the recognizing the value that the profession could have if we only met our potential. And because of that tireless hope of what we could be, this is why the three of us are here where we are now. But making it clear that your seat at the table, it is waiting for you, it is deserved, and you don't have to justify your presence to anybody within any of these associations. Yeah, it is. There you go. That's a clap. That's right. So our identities play a large role in our everyday lives, how we function, and how we function as leaders. The panel represents a huge diversity, not just in ethnicity, but in other ways, cultural, in other ways. How does your identity affect how you're leading and the impact you want to have on the field of school psychology? Well, let me jump in on this. I think it's interesting yeah, because um, when I was up for tenure um, in, at Penn State, uh, uh, I was getting some grief, even though I had the publications. My advisor um, said to me, do they know you're gay? And I said, yes. And she said, you shouldn't have told them until after you got tenure. Um, <laughs> that way you're having problems. I think one of the things that, 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 at least from my point of view, we bring different perspectives from the worlds that we are in. And so I study identity, right? But I study ethnic racial identity, but we have multiple identities, right? So identity as a scholar, as a scientist, um, as uh, uh, a sexual minority, as uh, ethnicity, as an immigrant. And what that does, it allows you, I think, to see the world differently. And that diversity of thought, I think, is really important in every space that you are in because it gives you perspectives that others don't have. Um, I've been lucky enough, brave enough, um, sometimes pay the price, to disagree with professors in class and stuff. Well, no. We don't do that that way in Trinidad, and, and, and it works fine. So this is not the way it has to be done, right? And I think that that's one of the things that multiple identities allows you to do. It allows you to give somebody else a different perspective. The other thing, I mean, I actually, there was a wonderful, um, very supportive professor at, at, at both of you as a grad student. And one day I think he was kind of frazzled, and he spoke to me in a way that was a little inappropriate <laughs> um, in class. And my response was, yes, Massa. And, <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and he turned red. But we had a conversation afterwards. And I think when he's frazzled in the future, he did not make that mistake. Um, and I stopped. So I think, again, you know, and I think perhaps if I were, you know, um, African American, I may not have done that because I might have been a little afraid. Right. But I think because I came out of a different tradition, same time when I kicked a student out of my office at Penn State who basically told me I was childish and immature because I was not going to change his grade. He felt his grade was better than it should have been. And I said, no, I can talk to you about why you got the grade. No, no. I said, you know, you need to leave my office. So your child is going to turn out, you're telling me to leave the office? I said, no, I'm ordering you to leave the office. Get the hell out now. And stuff. But again, it allows you, and then I, can, I, go, I went to a faculty meeting and we talked about this. And we talked about it at the all program meeting. Because we need to speak to these, we need to speak truths. Because many, I don't think many of my colleagues are intentionally racist. Um, and I think that many of the things that they do and many of the policies that people have, 
you know, these are things over there, but they don't see the yeah. problems. Yeah. We see the problems. Um, and some of them do too, but you know, many of them, because we are affected directly, right? right we see the problems sometimes, and, 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 because we, and so we can speak to that. And that in every room, in, including the board of NASA, yeah. yeah. APA, and TSP, and so forth. So in answering this question, I am reflecting on Greg and Carlita are always saying, that poor Stacy, like what is she doing? We worry about her, right? And so, because um, I just- to, to, to give context, Stacy Williams is one of the most bravest people I know. She can walk into a room of strangers and leave with, a for, with friends, an entire room of friends, immediately. So for me, um, I, I, I recognize that I have experienced uh, privilege. I have privileged identities um, outside of the United States. I'm also an immigrant. Um, I'm from Jamaica. I came to this country in 1989. I came from an upper middle class family. Um, if you don't know me, some of my friends call me bougie. And um, I came to America not knowing what microaggression was or racism and I would interact with people and um, my friends were like, did you see that? I'm like, what? He was just rude. And I would just, you know, go about my business. Um, but one of the things that my upbringing in Jamaica, and you know, at one point I went to finishing school, you know, my mom had hopes that I would meet someone in the royal family. It didn't happen. <laughs> but just in case, I would know how to curtsy, so I know how to curtsy and all of that stuff, right? Cotillion. That's my life prior to the United States. I come here and experience transitional poverty. And something happened, like I had a moment here. I was um, helping my aunt clean house in Westport, Connecticut um, for uh, a realtor. Um, and I don't know if he's still alive, like Ravis. I don't know if you guys see his name on stuff. Okay. And he treated me like I was nothing. I shouldn't have said that now, but like, and I was like, but I'm somebody. Like, like do you not know how smart I am? Do you not know that I went to... To, to British schools on the island, that's what I was thinking in my head, right? But the way that he spoke to me was in such a way that I've never been spoken like that in my entire life, right? And something happened. I started reflecting on how I treated the people back home who took care of us. How I treated my nanny, how we treated our housekeeper, how we treated our driver, like, and I felt mortified. When I was able to go back to Jamaica, I went straight to those people and I apologized for being a brat, like, and I'm like, I am so sorry, like, and they looked at me and they're like, Miss Stacy, you were young, like, we, no, 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 like, you don't understand. And then when I was hanging out with my cousins and I saw how they treated the folks who worked for the family, I was telling them, you can't do that, right? So when I came back to the United States, I'm like, it's really important for every, like everyone that I meet is a source of inspiration and that's how I treat my life. And I also don't know, like one of the things that um, it, it is one of my strengths and weaknesses and people will say this is that nine times out of 10, I'm not gonna remember your name. I'm not gonna remember who you are or what you've done. But when I interact with you, I'm gonna interact with you like you're just like a normal person. And you know, Natasha said today, like you have the, the best origin stories because when I first met Deborah Crockett on a boat, I started dancing with her, not knowing who she was. And then when I finally was told who she was, in, I met her in January, and then I got introduced to her in February <coughs> as the NAS president. I was like, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> when I met Frank, I did not know of his publications. I probably would not have said anything. Like we met at a pool. And I was like, wow, he's Caribbean, he's from Trinidad. And we started talking, and out of that talk, like an article was born. And so this is literally how I have lived my life. And I bring this into leadership spaces with me. And one of the things that um, my identity as a school psychologist is that as a systems person. And I'm a systems thinker consultant. And in order to do consulting work, you have to motivate the organizations or individuals within the organizations to um, work towards the vision that you have. And the organization needs to think that this is their vision and not your vision. And <laughs> Maris, when I 
At Maris, without a title, I created the Diversity Leadership Institute that was funded. And the people who worked in that institute were people who worked in the college that had jobs. And so like one of the folks who were my facilitators, she was the director of counseling. And people were like, how did you do that? Because I approached them like, you know, we have shared interests in equity work. How can we do this together? And so my, so that's how my identity have informed a lot of stuff. And, you know, like I'm going to, I went to Poland not knowing how to speak Polish. And my collaborator was like, Stace, you love people. Do you want to stay with the family? I said, you know that to be the case. Wow. I ended up staying with the family. Wow. I ended up being adopted by a diplomat for a day. Yes. And my host family is like, how is that possible? Seriously. When you open yourself up to the universe, and that's what I bring to the spaces that I'm in, the universe gifts you back in return. And when I think about the work that I've done in NIAS, again, you know, I did that without a title, and your mentor was the one that volunteered me to the board. And he's not even here today. But anyway, but so but that's how my experiences continue to inform the the what I say yes to and how I inspire individuals and spaces to work toward a collective vision. If Netflix wrote your movie, I would watch it twenty times. <laughs> <laughs> I touched upon a little bit in my presentation about how my identity has shaped my work, but following up on my colleagues, one of, because one of the things to highlight is that we are all of Caribbean descent, though I think I'm the only U.S. born individual here. I'm and US born. I'm also US well, I mean, from the, oh. <laughs> the three. Okay, okay. Neil <laughs> <laughs> But I think about those experiences because it's a bit of both. Um, that my parents immigrated to the U.S. My mother is a teenager. She went to high school in the U.S. My father, as an adult, he was in construction. And I remember something, like my father would tell us, my sister and I, stories from working on the construction sites and predominantly working with white construction workers. And how they used to tell, his name was William. They called him Bill. And they would say, well, Bill, you just, you different from the rest. And, you know, well, those over there, those are, those are troublemakers, that divisiveness to create a divide among black workers, that he is different because he is not from the U.S., he's Caribbean, and, you know, you came for a good life, don't get caught up with the American blacks and, and all of that trouble. Which is a oh, huge yes, conversation. Yes, yes, yes. But my father would tell us about it and say, well, I know that behind my back, they just called me an N-word that talked funny. And so to know that while the black community is a diaspora and quite diverse, and there were microaggressions and comments that I got growing up in Harlem from other black kids because my parents talked funny. Or I would have a little bit of, or say words a little bit funny because that's how my parents and my grandmother spoke. Or just different cultural traditions or not being aware of some American traditions. But again, I reflect back to what my father said that at the end of the day, they just look at us and know that we all black. And so it's not a matter of having this status or whatever have you because there is a, a lot of internalized anti-blackness in non-black communities of color as well as black immigrants community uh, black immigrant communities of color when we think about the treatment of black communities in the u.s and what they have learned and observed and again internalizing those messages so i just wanted to talk about that a little bit because i do think it's a it's an important distinction especially when we are working with black kids and we assume a universal black experience and that's not true right um, the other thing I want to share about how my identity is shapes how I navigate within leadership. And so Stacey mentioned about the angry black woman. And I, it's something I've always had to be aware of and being unfairly characterized as that if I speak passionately about an issue. And so going into meetings and having my talking points, but also being aware that I need to monitor myself my tone of voice, my volume, my modulation. So there is a focus on the message and things that I'm saying as opposed to it being dismissed. And there are times that, of course, I get excited and think about issues that I am passionate about and that we clearly need to do something different. And it's known. And I'll talk to colleagues afterwards. I'm like, I hope I didn't sound hysterical. Or, and it's, 
And I hate that I have to ask that question, but it's still a question that I have to ask so that my white colleagues, my white female colleagues, as well as my male colleagues don't. That I have to consider the talking points that I have and also how I present it to make sure that it is accepted validly. But at the same time though, I lean into my experiences of navigating black womanhood um, and certain, what do I learn from that as a black woman who have been, I think about the history of black women in education and psychology spaces and the work that we have done, it really has been on black women and how do I empower that and knowing that I have a broader legacy. And so, yeah, the stereotype of the angry black woman, I have said that at board meetings, I am, I am angry. This is why. <laughs> because often the harm of the angry black woman stereotype is that anger, our anger isn't justified or that it's wrong to be angry. Not wrong to be angry, certainly have plenty to be angry about. <laughs> but I have gone into labeling these emotions and telling people exactly why I am angry. And these are the things that we need to do differently. And so again, still a fine line of, of navigating, but leaning into that and knowing that we don't do leadership unemotionally or objectively. Objectivity is a myth, it doesn't exist. But how do we lean into those things? Because our emotions matter. That when I am feeling upset about something that is valid, there's a reason why. And that as a whole, we need to be more in touch with our emotions. And when we're feeling these strong emotions about something, <laughs> as opposed to running away from it, leaning in and thinking about, well, what makes us feel uncomfortable about this in the first place? And so I model that, I try to model that for my colleagues when I'm presenting things and encourage them to do the same. You, you mentioned earlier um, anti-blackness and just coming from the communities you come from, but just, just throw it out, I'm so happy that we got to talk about our cultural identities because I often think oh, we're just so lazy, you know, in this country in terms of white and black. I don't want to know that you're white. I'm, I'm, what kind of white are you? Irish, you know, Italian, you know, you know don't call me I'm Haitian, you know. You're uh, Jamaican. Jamaican, you're too Jamaican, you're Trinidadian. Uh, there's just so much more. We'll forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll deal with that later. There's no <laughs> there. Um, but there's just so much rich history and understanding someone's culture, uh, understanding someone's identity. But even, you know, speaking with our communities, there's a lot of our own communities that feel that the field is anti-black. Yes. And uh, historically, we've had a lot of difficulty with recruitment of school psychologists in this field. And I know on an organization level, we're making a lot of changes and uh, we have a lot of allies to kind of uh, support these changes, but what, what are you guys doing individually in your organizations, in your roles, uh, to support this, this recruitment and the changes? I'm sorry, recruitment and retention. Sure, it's just because we're in the field and we stay here. Exactly, because I was about to say, um, we have actually, not we, but I think the profession has done a good job of getting more graduate students of color. So when we look at the five-year NAS membership survey, no, um, graduate student survey, and a, a trend of over the past five years, they've been collecting data on graduate programs, a, about close to a third of graduate students identify as people of color. But we don't see that same thing within the profession at all. Which means, so if we're at about a third grad students that identify as people of color, but then when we look at the profession itself, and it's only about 11%, what's happening? Right. And that's that retention piece leaving because this is not the profession that I thought it would be. I'm not able to make the changes I thought I would. Um, I, I just don't feel welcome or a sense of belongingness. And at the core of it, that anti-blackness that you mentioned, and that goes back to the things that we take a stance for or the things that we are silent on. From, as a professional association, because that was a question about what we're doing organizationally, advocating and making sure that our actions actually align with the professional positions that we've taken with regards to social justice definition. We also have an anti-racism resolution as well as a number of resolutions that talk about racial equity. But do our actions align with that? Does our advocacy align with that? Are we speaking up on issues that impact black communities? Because if we don't do that, all of it is hollow. 
that it's performative, that you have these statements because they look good, just like everybody in 2020 had a statement. Right. But what did they do afterwards? That's where the rubber meets the road. And the more our actions are congruent with what we like to believe we are as an association, as a socially just, anti-racist organization, when our actions are congruent with that, it's noticeable, just like with the ABCI apology, that let your actions reflect with that. And so others will see that when school psychologists are treating black kids in pre-K through 12 schools and recognizing their humanity, they, rec they remember the school psychologists who are kind to them. Yeah. And they think like, well, hey, I kind of, I remember Miss so-and-so, they were kind of cool and they were really, really helpful. I want to do that type of job. And then they go to graduate programs where they see faculty who look like them and they are reading about issues that are important to their community and interventions, because that's the other thing. We'll talk about people of color all day, but when we look at our intervention research, there's certainly a gap there that I am learning about interventions, not just individual interventions, but systems level interventions and advocacy that will help kids that look like me and what I needed when I was in school. And that's how we help to promote recruitment and retention, and certainly that's the direction I'm moving towards within that. So I'll talk about retention from TSV. Um, we have two, we have several exciting things coming out. We have two special issue journals coming out about demystifying the academy. And I know that folks have started like talking about demystifying the academy. They're, they're, unwritten rules in the academy that um, determine who gets tenured and not, right? And so we have um, several scholars of color that are talking about their experiences and offering strategies for junior faculty about how they can be successful in those communities. Something that NAS does and partners with TSB at the Trainers Conference is there is an early career group that actually started at TSB, but anyway, but we share that group. There's an early career group that really attempts to um, mentor um, junior scholars about how to be successful in this group. And Amanda Sullivan actually started that group as her passion project. I know that there, there are spaces like SBRCC that's trying to diversify the mentors that are in that group, and that's something out of uh, NAS in terms of um, allowing faculty of color to believe that they belong. But those things are far and few between. And so that's what we're doing at the trainer's level. In my life, like sometimes I wonder like why I even do these things because I believe that these things are really important for me. So one of the reasons why I actually started the Diversity Institute at Marist was to um, reduce the labor on faculty of color to be the only ones that were gonna be responsible for any and all diversity issues in the college. Because research suggests that faculty of color who do, do diversity work, they never get tenured because their diversity work is not necessarily valued in terms of tenureship. And typically those faculty of color, where they don't get tenure, they leave, right? And so then you're leaving. So when, when you talk about students not seeing representation, the institution as a whole doesn't is not really created for folks to be successful. And so whatever spaces that I'm in, I'm always challenging the folks who are making the decisions about the 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 service load that they tend to give these faculty. And I'm like, how do you expect them to get tenure? Or for a fact, so I do a lot of stuff at, in higher ed. In higher ed, when they try to diversify the field, they have these low hanging fruits which are called visiting professor lines. And you know, and so what happens is the university gets their diversity box check, students of color come in, but that seriously is a revolving door. Now most faculty of color that come in on those visiting lines, they're actual superstar. And when they leave, the, the college is like, well, where they go at? Well, you do realize that they were overqualified for this position. And so one of the things that I've done, and my, you know, Byron talked about being influential in the spaces that you're in, in your own sphere. One of the things that I've done is, you know, folks will ask me to sit on a, a, a hiring committee because they need diversity on there. And I'll say to them, because you know, I'm, I'm trying to get tenure, and I'm like, am I here for my expertise or for a number? Because I need to know. Because I will play the game and be there for the number because then I can spend my energies elsewhere. But if I'm there for my expertise, then I'll participate. And if I'm there for my expertise, some of the things I've done over time at my previous institution is I've changed the announcements in our recruitment of our faculty of color. 
Now that was a tough battle, and when it happened, you know, like some folks were resisting, and when it happened, the folk who was resisting came to my office and was like, Stacy, we did it! And I'm like, yay, awesome. And that's changed. And then we brought in a faculty, and so another low-hanging fruit is like, well, let's let's invite you in, and if we like you, then we'll we'll offer you T and T. Seriously? And so, you know, and then we'll offer them TNT, but we won't give them the time when they were here to begin with. And so what I've found that I've done is like, you know, once you're tenure, you can say some stuff and folks can't get rid of you that easily. And I'll be like, unacceptable. And you know, for the last um, committee that I was on, I took it all the way up the food chain. I said, this faculty of color came in on a visiting line, they produced, they should get that time back, and that person got that time back. So again, you think about, you know, that's the little that I'm doing for retention. I also run mentoring workshop with junior faculty where I said, okay, what's your identity as a scholar? And how can we align your scholarship research and service together so that when you're saying yes to stuff, it's checking one of those boxes. And so, and I always reach out, and sometimes I'm like, why am I doing this? But like, I reach out, I know why I'm doing this, because I wanted someone to do this for me when I was in the profession. I wanted someone to create that space for me to be successful. And because now I know, and now I understand the game that people didn't tell me about. And so when you talk about graduate students, if graduate students don't have a faculty mentor to mentor them into the academy, then they don't know the unwritten rules. And so they get into the academy completely blindsided because they've never been mentored. So if I'm in a position to say, listen, here's a new faculty, let's meet. And you know, I'm no longer at my previous institution, but they hired an amazing scholar and I reached out to her. And we had coffee. And then I said, you know, I should charge the president for this, you know, because I'm doing this mentoring work. But then I said, she told me what was happening. I called the VP's um, office and I said, listen, two things you guys did right. You had your cohort um, hire, and number, the second thing you did right, you put the cohort hires together in the same area so that they can support each other, right? Remember, I'm no longer there. By the way, my name at the previous institution is that X, you know, the person that you break up with and they're always there. Because I'm truly, like, it doesn't matter where you are, I am, absolutely invested in you being successful. So that's the personal um, sphere. And then, you know, that's it. All right, um, AB has been doing a, a lot of stuff over the years, trying. Um, uh, at one point in time, before they used to pay um, for all the Knights of Council, they pay for minority council members. So if a division elected um, a person of color to council, they got paid, you know, full freight in a way that um, um, white colleagues did not. Um, there's a minority fellowship program that goes back to, I think, the late 70s, um, um, and, um, and it really does, um, we do that, we have a congressional fellowship program, um, it just got announced this year, one of my former postdocs at African American Males is gonna be um, working with a, a congressperson. Um, we have a diversity matrix <laughs> that we use when we are, forming any board, uh, committee board, task force, work group that, you know, um, and it, it has not just career stage and short geographic location, ethnic racial diversity, religious diversity, sexual, I mean, so, I mean, forming a committee of six, <laughs> you know, it's a little hard, hard sometimes, but, 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 but taking it very, very seriously. And, and, and then, of course, the most recent work is the apology and stuff, but alongside that, we have actually created an editorial fellows program to train junior scholars of color so they can become editors of journals, be competitive um, for journal, um, journal editorships. We, are, we have a high school a program to introduce scholars of color to high school students. Um, and so we've been doing a, a, a lot of stuff. Um, and the EDI Action Plan, as I, I mentioned, the $1.1 million seed fund that we're gonna start um, way forward. So, so there's a lot of work happening in that space. Um, it's important to do it because even though it's, it's big, right? So, you know, we are a big organization. Mm -hmm. and we're 133,000 members, so. Yeah, you guys are large. Mm -hmm. um, I do, everything that you guys said, you gave us some recommendations on what we need to do to move the field forward, recruitment and retention. Um, Stacey, you did say that there, you had some struggles um, trying to make change. Um, and we know that sometimes in the profession we hear it all the time that we, we know we need to do something different, but this is the way it is, and they're resistant to that change. Um, I do have one last question. I know it's time to wrap up, guys, but I'm going to ask this question, right? But I'm going to ask this question, all right? 
Yeah, sorry, I'm gonna ask a question, right? So, in, in trying to re release some of your stress, because you were trying to do change, and, you're, and it, it, it causes stress on you as a black practitioner, right? Do you leverage ally relationships to help create your change within your organizations? And what recommendations can you give to us as emerging leaders? The short answer to that question is yes. I've learned a lot um, from white women. I've learned to leverage the privilege of white women. And um, I've been very successful in doing that. Um, but I, well, that doesn't sound really great. Strike that from the video. But anyway, <laughs> but um, allyship. So here's the thing. You know, you, as, as I'm thinking about the consultation literature, and um, from the consultation literature, it says that one of the ways in which we um, move initiatives in an organization is, especially if you're a woman, is using informational power and referent power. I use both of those power bases when I'm interacting with individuals within an organization. When, when you first attempt to do any type of initiative, or here's an example, a diversity initiative, I do a needs assessment of the lay of the land. Like, who are the key players? What, are, what is likely to be the resistance? You just listen to people. Um, Daryl Wingsu in Race Talk uh, talks about, the, um, uh, he talks about understanding what's not being said and all of that stuff. So that's a great book to paint the landscape. And in doing that, I identify who are allies and who are optical allies. I also identify who are allies that have sway within the organization that you're in. And then I approach those allies. And then I basically have conversations with those allies. And then typically the allies would be the one to say, okay, I want to do this. And I purposely say, I don't want to lead this because I'm a junior faculty. And I said, but I'm happy to support you in leading this initiative. So initially, I'm going to put my white allies on the front line to be the representative of this initiative. So this is, this is my lived experience. It may not be the others. And when I put them on the front line, remember I told you, I like working in the back. I've worked in the back for many, many years and folks not knowing what I've been doing, but I've been doing stuff because the folk on the front line, they're just there representing, right? So when we created this initiative at my institution, it was called Creating Inclusive Classroom. It's a culturally, um, it's a cultural competency faculty ped pedagogical model. And the three leaders were all white women. I developed the curriculum. I, I, I identified how we would deliver the curriculum. I decided if we wanted buy-in, we were gonna use the consultee-centered framework as buy-in and all of these other things. But the people on the front line, so my colleagues led that initiative, and when they proposed that initiative, everyone in the school was like, this is great, right? Because it didn't look like me, so it, wasn't, it was not necessarily a diversity initiative. So the resistance that you would have likely gotten in the, that environment was not initially there. After leading the charge for three years, I also came up with a research agenda, collected data, we wrote about our program, we consult about our program, and all of these other things, right? And so, at some point, one of my colleagues said, one of my white allies, short white woman that I absolutely love, I've cried in her lap, and she said to me, Stacy, it's time for you to step up. I'm like, but why? And I said, fine. So I finally stepped up. Because now, the, the initiative had already um, garnered traction in the school. It was no longer a Stacy initiative, it was a school initiative. And from that um, initial initiative, we used the data from that to create our Leadership Institute. And in the Leadership Institute, again, you know, I, I was not like front and center. I had like, I have this nucleus group and they're amazing. And you know, I empowered them to be visible across the college. So it was our collective initiative, but it wasn't me. But you best believe when they were in spaces, they were like, Stacey, no, you talk. Like you talk to the president, like you got this. And so for me, I found it helpful, again, my lived experience, as uh, uh, my lived experience to really corral the excitement of my colleagues who have legitimate power and reference power within an organization to deploy an initiative. I mentioned before that anchor is a powerful form for action and moving things forward. Emotions in general are white guilt being one of them. And so when in when colleagues attend social justice related workshops and when I present in board meetings for actions, 
I break down the outline for it and bring that critical consciousness lens because at the end of the day, all the actions that we take as leaders are ultimately rooted in social justice, or should be because all of the problems that we have in our profession, workforce shortages, um, practice model, are ultimately social justice issues. And so what happens is colleagues will read about these things and like, oh my goodness, I didn't know this, I feel so bad. Yeah, and they're talking to me about it. So what you gonna do? Because you feel like you you feel guilty about this, great. But your guilt and engaging and beating yourself up isn't going to make anything better. Nor am I going to comfort and soothe you and tell you that you shouldn't feel guilty about this. That yeah, when you hear these ugly parts about history, and you don't, and it wasn't you personally, but your community, and that these things happen. You should feel a sense of, of guilt about it. I remember the first time I read um, Lois Lowry's book, Number of the Stars, and learning about the Holocaust and feeling awful about that and being motivated to work towards justice is the same type of thing. And so no, I have absolutely no problems when colleagues are feeling guilty about this and learning something to push them to do a little bit more. As well, and the other strategy is looking at reconciling that cognitive dissonance. And I touched upon that earlier, that colleagues, school psychologists, care about kids, want to do right by kids, and which is why there's this feeling of guilt oftentimes when you're hearing about these social inequities and, and oh, I should do something, but I don't know what to do. And, and But you talk about social justice and you use the terms, but your actions don't reconcile with that. And so how you see yourself to be, your actions don't reflect that. So I'm gonna challenge you to reconcile so your actions are more congruent with your stated beliefs because right now they're not. And that's not a conversation that a lot of people have with them. That us caring about social justice doesn't mean that we're engaging in social justice work. But that's often, um, sometimes school psychologists feel that way, that you, I've got knowledge, I'm more aware, so now I'm a social justice advocate. You're not until you're actually doing something. And so I remind leaders about that, that this is what you say, but this action that you were suggesting or proposing to take doesn't align with social justice. What do you want to do and how do you want to perceive yourself? I'll be brief, I know we have a time. I agree, you can't do this work alone. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's impossible. And I, in fact, and I think even if you could, you should not. Because this is work for the collective, it's work for everybody, everybody has to be a part of this. Um, I would say as a junior faculty member at Penn State, I was much less successful in some sense because um, and the, my biggest impact I think happened when I made a very public resignation from uh, a, a committee um, because the, there was a lot of performance going on at the, the, the campus administration level but they weren't backing it up and I decided I'm stepping down publicly to, to push, push them. At Berkeley, it's been under Lesia. We have a history of social justice and action, so um, even the people who are not necessarily doing a lot spout that point of view. Um, but but you are able to find allies. The School of Education at Berkeley is one of the most diverse um, schools on campus, um, both in terms of faculty and student body. So um, and, and there are a number of us who study these kinds of issues. Um, we have a, an equity office at Berkeley that every faculty position has to go through. I mean, you know, so it's, you will get a faculty position sent back if you don't address the equity issue. And certainly we do that internally as well in the school. Um, we have an equity office in the school. And the other thing I'd say that, you know, I, I think you need to get along with people. Um, I, I teach consultation, so <laughs> I agree with Stacy that you, you, you use that. But as a tenured person and a more senior person, I've been able to get in. I'm currently the faculty chair of the School of Education, so I can call meetings. I can, I can do convenings. Um, I was associate dean for academic affairs, so I was over promotion and tenure, and I was able to get minority faculty promoted, who may not have gotten promoted if I were not in that role, uh -huh. and stuff, because I was able to say, well, this is comparable to this, <laughs> and so forth. So, so being in positions of leadership, you know, so so volunteering for those kinds of positions where you get to cheer and and, and, and help set the policy, I think, is a useful way to to do. Yeah. Uh, oh. um, no, I just want to say thank you to all three of you as panelists. Um, everything you said here uh, was very important, and we need to discuss. And we actually need broader conversations on each and everything that you touched on. 
we want to make sure that we do that later on. But again, I just want to like, thank you for everything that you've done. So uh, please give a round of applause to our <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you again, everyone. Um, thank you to build off of what was said here, not just being a part of this moment, but being a part of this movement, right? Um, and in that, to piggyback back off of what Frank said, that's why we are going to play ball with ball. And with that, I would like to present you each with uh, some nice swag. You all always be a part of the Nias family and always welcome uh, with us here. Of course, they still have to do this. Thank you again.